Okay, we are recording. I appreciate that, Eric. Thank you. Okay, so um, so higher order functions. We've got um, uh, functions that accept other functions as input and anonymous functions. So um, let me just bring up my little laser pointer. So for example, here's an anonymous function. Remember, anonymous functions begin with backslash. This is the name of the parameter x. This is the indicator. This is the body of the function. So anonymous function that just takes whatever x is and multiplies it by the score multiplier. Notice that score multiplier is a variable that's been defined up here. So we're capturing that variable in the closure of this anonymous function, passing that whole thing to list.map and applying it to the score, the highest scores um, uh, um, uh, list. Okay, so pretty straightforward. I mean, we've seen this a lot of times now, and so hopefully you get the idea. Uh, it's just like a lot of other languages that we know and love. Okay, now um, let's talk about types though. So we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about types, type annotations, and algebraic data types. Don't be scared by that. Um, it's not that complicated. It's actually pretty straightforward. But there's a couple of interesting things that you get with algebraic data types. Let's start though with basic type annotations. So we've seen that in, um, We've seen that in Elm, type annotations come with a little colon after it, so five is annotated, and that means it's, we're, saying, we're saying it's an int, um, 6.7, float, hello, fool, all of those things. Um, we can also annotate, an, um, annotate the types of functions. So, sorry, I'm just gonna, gonna figure out a better place to stick this. Sorry, I'm just moving a, a, little, bit of, a little window around. I find it. A little difficult to. Uh, what I really need is another screen. Okay. So sorry about that. So we're going to use all this. Okay. So you have functions. We can annotate functions with the type signature of the function. Remember, everything um, sort of to the left of the last arrow are the inputs, and everything to the right of the last arrow is the outputs. So double is a function that accepts as input an int and returns as output also an int. And you know, here, here it is. So that's the function called double. Interestingly enough, um, Elm also supports what are called parametric types. So for example, here's a function called list.map. We've all seen the map function. Map function is a function that accepts two arguments, a parameter, sorry, a, a function, um, that accepts an input something and returns this output something and then a list and it returns a list And what I think is really cool about parametric type systems is the fact that you can type annotate Something like the map function Like this. So let's see if we can decipher this. So the first argument notice we had to parenthesize it So those do not confuse things. The first argument is a function That takes a to b now notice these are lowercase the lower case means it's a variable, a type variable. So this is just some type. It could be int, it could be char, it could be string, it could be bool, whatever. And this function that we're passing is a function that takes things of type A and maps them to things of type B. So that's the first parameter. It's a function that maps A's to B's. Second parameter is a list. And the list has to be a list of things of type A. Of course, that makes sense because the function that we're passing in is going to trans, um, it's going to calculate A's, it's going to map A's to B's. So the first parameter has to be a list and it has to have type A and that is the same A. So this is cool because what that means is it means that the compiler can actually type check things like the map function for us. It knows we have a list of things of type A, it knows that this function maps A's to B's and it knows therefore that the result will be a list of things of type B. I think is really cool. So this is called type variables. And um, um, we'll see some more examples of that in just a second with algebraic data types. And then of course you've got things like add or other things where um, this is more like a simple, um, this is like a simple type annotation um, where notice that this is not capital N number, it's lowercase n number. So this is just a type variable. So this just says that there's some function called add, which takes as input something, we're calling it of type number, but it could be like an A, 
it's taking one of the, it's taking one of those, it's taking another of those, and it's giving back a third thing that is of that same type. So in this case, you could imagine that if you had an add function and you passed in a string and a string, it would return back a string, or an int and an int, and it would pass you back an int. Um, but you could not pass in an int and a string because those would be different types. And this is saying that you get the same type um, for all three. Okay, Andy, what's up? Um, does this mean that like somewhere else in the program you have to define it like number equals int or number equals string? Or does this mean that hey, these need to match, but we're not defining whatever they specifically are, just that whatever comes in at the beginning has to be what comes out in the middle and the end? Um, it is the second. So we never define what number is. This is a type variable. So all we're saying here, so we're saying something that's a little bit weaker. It's still a, a strong type annotation. We're saying the add function takes two things of the same type and will return a third thing of that type. So that is information that the compiler can use to type check a program, but it's weaker than, say, a C style type annotation where you actually have to have a specific type. So no, we would not ever define number that this is just a variable. It's a type variable and it, this, this holds for all types. Does that make sense? I'm going to assume that your silence means yes. <laughs> okay, great. So let's keep going. Um, so let's talk a little bit about algebraic data types. So an algebraic data type, don't get, um, don't get scared by the word algebraic. Algebraic data types just come from the idea, um, so there's actually some sort of deep mathematical theory behind this, it comes from the idea of algebras, and algebras usually have sum operations and product operations. And when we think about algebraic data types, there's some abstract connections with um, um, sort of generalized notion of what a sum and what a product is. Uh, it's, we're not gonna worry about that too much in this class, uh, but just be aware that it's not that scary. So what we've got here is we've got a couple of different, a couple of examples of what are called algebraic data types. So what is an algebraic data type? It is a data type that has several different options. So for example, here we have a type declaration for something called a direction. So a type direction is equal to, it's either a north, a south, an east, or a west. We're not defining what those are right now, but this is called a sum data type because um, roughly speaking, we're taking the or of these four things. So a direction can be one of these four things. Um, a product data type is sort of like an and, and we'll see some examples of that a little bit later. Andy, go ahead. Uh, is this kind of like how a number can be a float or an int or a double type of thing? Yes. So, um, so this is a very simple example. And this, so that by giving us this kind of, by creating this kind of type, the compiler can check to make sure that things that we're passing around that are directions um, are sort of properly, properly typed. And you'll see some examples of this when you um, work on your, uh, when you work on your, tic-tac-toe client. Um, let's see a, more, a slightly more, more interesting thing though. Here's a little tree data type. So the little tree data type, oops, sorry. Here's a little integer tree. So an integer tree is either a leaf or it's a node that contains an integer and an int tree and an int tree. Okay, does that make sense? So, so this is kind of interesting because the type is recursively defined in terms of itself. I mean, it almost feels like a data structure, but this is actually a type. And so the compiler can do some really interesting pattern matching and type checking, as well as some super strict rules about things like case statements where it makes sure that you catch all cases because it can analyze the types of the things involved at a very granular level. So this tree is, so you can sort of imagine that you can build up a little tree um, consisting of either leaf nodes or internal nodes that contain integers and have further children. Um, but you could actually take this integer tree and say, well, what if I didn't want to have integers? What if I wanted to have floats or strings? 
well, we could use that idea of type parameters to parameterize the int tree and just come up with a generalized tree. So let's look over here on the upper right. So here's a type of what's called tree, and then there's a parameter a, and this is saying that we can create trees of with ints or strings or whatever it might be, and they consist of either a leaf node or a node containing something of type A, and then a sort of left thing, which is of type tree of A, and the right thing, which is called, which is also a tree of A. So in this way, you, we can easily create um, trees of integers or strings or floats or numbers or whatever it might be. Um, finally, here is a little example of uh, how we can actually use these more complex algebraic data types in conjunction with code to process items of this type. So hopefully you're, you're getting the sense that like, wow, it's almost like types and data structures, like the line is being blurred between types and data structures. So let's see, um, let's see what this is doing. Sorry, gotta move some windows here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so here's a function, it's called leftmost element. And you give me a tree, so it accepts as input a tree with some type A, and it's gonna return a result that's called a maybe of type A. We'll talk about what maybe is in just a minute. But for now, just think about this as a return, a return value. So leftmost element, you give me a variable called tree. And what this function does is it just, it's a recursive, it's a recursive thing. So we are gonna switch on the variable called tree. And here, um, if there's a leaf node, so if tree is a leaf node, this is the base case, then we return nothing. If, however, the tree is a node x, a leaf, and then something, we don't care what it is, then we're going to return just x. So notice that we're using pattern matching in conjunction with the type signature to help us think through all of the cases of what we need to do with, if, there's a, if we're processing a tree. So node x, so x is the thing that the tree, that the actual node contains. And then we're saying to the left, there's a leaf. And so that means we found the leftmost item, like we can't go left any further. And to the right is a blank. We don't care what the right is. And if we in, ever encounter this pattern in our tree data structure, then we return this thing called just x. Similarly, if we see a node and we see, um, and there's some value associated with that node, underscore means don't care, and we see some subtree on the left, and again, we don't actually care what's on the right, then we're gonna recurse, and we're going to, the return value of hitting this case statement will be leftmost element of, and then we'll call it on the subtree. Can you explain what maybe and just refer yep. to? Yep, we're gonna do that in just a second. That's actually on the next slide, I believe. Mm. Okay, it's actually right here. <laughs> uh, we'll go back. That's a good question, so we might as well cover right now. So maybe is an algebraic data type that has a type signature that looks like this. So maybe an A, means that it is either nothing or just an A. And, um, and so the reason that we have the maybe data type, and this is actually not an Elm idea, this also is used in other languages. The idea is there are times when we have data flowing through a program and instead of having it like, like strings maybe, like maybe you, Maybe you go to the network, you're trying to read something from the network and you have a function and it's supposed to return a string. And you can, maybe you've all written code like this where if something goes wrong, you just return undefined. And then that undefined can wend its way through your program and all sorts of havoc can result. The idea of defining a maybe type is that you either got a result 
and that result is a concrete thing of type A, or you got something called nothing. But the point is that this algebraic data type, you both cases are explicitly accounted for in the type signature itself. And what that means is that means that the compiler can check to make sure that you're testing for the times when a nothing may have happened. So if we go back over here, the idea of the leftmost element here is you give me a tree and I'm gonna give you back a maybe. Well, what that means is that means that if you give me an empty tree, there is no leftmost element. So what I should return is nothing. But if you give me a tree that has some values in it, then I can return something of the, of the proper value. And so I'm gonna return a maybe because it may be that there's nothing to return. There's no proper value, I'll return nothing. But it may be that there's a concrete value. And so whoever calls me, if we're gonna write good code, needs to explicitly acknowledge the fact that they might be getting back um, an empty result. And they have to deal with that. And the, and the compiler can actually check to make sure that they do deal with it. And that's what's awesome about, um, and that's what's awesome about this. So if we go back here, um, so for example, let's imagine that you give me a list and you just wanna know what the head of the list is. So there's this um, function called list.head and list.head does not return a thing of a specific type, it returns a maybe. And the reason is, if a list is empty, then there's no head of the list, and so it's going to return empty. And so if we stick this into a case statement, the compiler will yell at us if we don't handle both cases. And the advantage of algebraic data types being involved in all of this is that the compiler can explicitly check both cases, and it can know that both cases have been handled properly. This, this, I think this is one of the reasons why they say there are no runtime errors in Elm. It's because it forces you to cope with all of the proper cases. And that's enforced at compile time, which is awesome. But you have to have these more, slightly more complicated type annotations. So I think it's a beautiful solution to the problem of needing to sort of not know beforehand what type of thing you're gonna return. Okay, so there was a question. Um, sorry, let me just pull it up here. Uh, the way they write types is pretty much exactly like TypeScript. Hmm. Uh, to be honest, I don't know TypeScript. So, so since you're asking that question, Grant, I'm going to guess that the answer is yes. Because I'm guessing that you know TypeScript, and I'm guessing that you think it's the same. <laughs> okay. Um, um, question. Yeah. The, you said Elm doesn't have a none type, so nothing is like a custom type that we've created? Uh, yes, although I think by convention, it's um, people call it nothing. So like all of the standard library, I think, I think that I'm pretty sure the maybe type is actually a, um, it's like a convention that the standard library has settled on. But um, as far as I know, there's nothing special about the nothing type. It's just another type. Okay. So it's not like some other languages where undefined is like a distinguished kind of thing. Right, cool. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, oh, Kylan, Kylan says maybe it's more like Swift. I also don't know Swift. I know, right? I don't know every language, guys. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so let's keep going though. So here's, um, well, actually, we pretty much just saw this. Here's a slightly different way to think about leaves and trees. This is actually Haskell syntax, but you get exactly the same idea of pattern matching and ADT. So here's a different version of a tree data type where the tree is either an empty tree or there's a leaf node. And actually, they in this particular definition, which I think makes a little more sense, they put the int in the leaf, and then you have a node which contains subtrees, the left and right. Again, it's a recursively defined type. And then you can pattern match on functions. So again, this is Haskell syntax, but looks a lot like, uh, looks a lot like Elm. Here's a depth function, which calculates the depth of the tree. So it's a function that maps a tree to an integer. If it's in the empty tree, then the result is zero. 
If we're at a leaf node, then the result is one. Otherwise, we pattern match on a node and an L and an R. Those become variables that we can then reference on the right-hand side. So we can go ahead and calculate the result of the depth of the tree is one plus the max of the depth on the left-hand side and the depth on the right-hand side. And again, the cool thing about this is the compiler can statically check all of these cases to make sure that the depth function is properly accounting for all possible trees that get passed in. It helps the programmer make sure that they haven't missed a case, which I think is super helpful. Uh, one other interesting thing on algebraic data types is that it's like um, really close to the abstract syntax trees and the, like the grammars that we've seen. So here, for example, is a little type for something called an expression, which is either a number node with an integer or an add node with some expressions. Um, so you could actually imagine building up things like abstract syntax trees using a simple type like this. And um, the idea would be that because it's a type, just like an integer or a string, the compiler can help you out by checking to make sure that you're catching all of the different cases. So this would actually be an element of that type. Okay, um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about um, was, let's consider this example of leaves and trees one more time but from a slightly different perspective. So you look at the code on the left and you might say, well, that's pretty cool that like, you know, I mean, I guess it's cool that like, we can write this pretty nice compact code and sort of is going to dispatch to one of these three cases based on uh, based on pattern matching. It's like, that's awesome, but, but couldn't I just write a case statement to do that? The answer is yes, of course you could. And if you wanted to, you could, you know, the case statement might look something like this. This is again, pseudocode. Um, I thought it was a pretty good example. And there's a couple of disadvantages to this. One is, I mean, it's a little longer, but that's not really the issue. The bigger issue is type safety and whether or not the compiler can statically analyze your cases and help you out as far as making sure that your code is correct. So one of the interesting problems with this um, code on the right is, uh, so, and I, I probably, I'm sorry, I should, probably should have um, written the field version, but you can imagine um, if we use this tree definition, sorry, uh, this one, you have either a leaf that holds an integer or a node that holds two things of type tree, that you could access those with different fields. And so, for example, if it's a leaf, then maybe you would have field one and you call that an integer, that would be like, where you would store the actual value. And then maybe you'd have fields for the left and the right trees. Um, and maybe because you're trying to compress things, you would reuse one of the fields. You could totally do that. And the compiler couldn't help you out at all. There's a couple of things it couldn't help you out with. One, it would have a hard time assigning a consistent value to the state of that field, uh, sorry, consistent type, um, because here you're using it as an integer and here you're using it as something of type tree. The other thing though that I think is potentially wrong is, or potentially, um, sorry, opens up the possibility for bugs, is the fact that here there's no type safety, meaning if it's a leaf node, you could try to access data.field2 and things would just crash. The compiler couldn't help you out. Whereas over here, it's like if it's a leaf node, like there is no L and R for you to even access on the right hand side. Like it's not even in your scope. And so over here, it's like programmer discipline has to, is the only thing holding you back from not accessing field two at the wrong moment. Whereas over here, scoping is also helping you out. Scoping and typing both together are helping you so that you only access the right things at the right times. And then again, it's actually much easier for the compiler to statically check all of the types um, if you have an ADT. Whereas over here, um, because of things like Collot's conjecture, if this is just ar like arbitrary stuff, 
it's almost impossible for the compiler to make sure that you didn't that you covered all the cases and that you didn't have redundant cases and things like that. So it's a very clean way to program, and I think um, I think there's a lot of value in thinking through it. Um, oh yeah, and so if you miss a if you miss a case, then you get something like this. So here's a case where, for example, there's some day of the week. Uh, sorry, sorry, a little function, a little expression that tries to map um, a day, which is represented as a number, to a string, which tells you which day of the week that string is. And because it's a number, um, you know, there's infinite possibilities. We know what to do if it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. But in this particular case statement, like what if you pass it a 7? And the answer is, like, I don't know. There's no, we don't handle that case, but that is a valid integer. And so the compiler will yell at you because you didn't cover all of your cases. So maybe you need to put in like a catch all or something like that. And another example of a beautiful error message that I love. Okay, so we, all, we already saw the maybe type. Um, so we can keep going. Oh yeah, found this interesting quote. The billion dollar mistake by Tony Hoare. Oh, I guess it's Hoare Hoare. I don't know quite how to say that. If anybody knows, let me know. Um, he said, I call it my billion dollar mistake. It was the invention of the null reference in 1965. At that time, I was designing the first comprehensive type system for references in an object-oriented language, Algol W. My goal was to ensure that all use of references should be absolutely safe with, er with checking performed automatically by the compiler. That's what we get when we use the maybe um, type. But I couldn't resist the temptation to put in a null reference simply because it was so easy to implement. This has led to innumerable errors, vulnerabilities, and system crashes, which have probably caused a billion dollars of pain and damage in the last 40 years. Yeah, I think that's right. He should repent. Anyway, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, kind of funny that it felt like he was on the right track at the beginning of designing this language, but then um, somehow got off like the deep end and um, made this mistake that to this day causes us pain and grief. Um, oh yeah, let me say one other cool thing about these type systems. So here's a little algebraic data type called either. So either is a type that's, you give it two types, A or B, and it's either a left A or a right, whoops, okay, sorry. I gotta, I gotta fix this, this is, this is wrong, hold on. B, sorry about that. Um, it's, so a, a thing that's either A, B, it's left A or right B. Left and right, again, are just made up words, they don't matter here. Um, but what we can do is we can define a type. I'm going to define a type called my list, and it is a list. And remember, lists are parameterized with types. And so I'm going to give list the type of either int char. And what that means is that means that this particular list. So remember, I said lists have to all be the same type. And you probably were thinking, oh, that means they have to be integers or they all have to be chars, or they all have to be strings, or they all have to be floats, which is mostly true, but not entirely true. If we use an algebraic data type with an or operator, then I can create a list where every element in the list is either an integer or a char. I think that's really cool because in other languages, it's like, like I don't know, think JavaScript or, or Julia. If you have a list, it's like in Julia, I can either say, a list is a list of integers, or it's a list of any. And there's kind of nothing in between. It's like it's all the same type, or it's all anything. And the compiler just can't help you very much if you've got any's floating around. But here, you can actually define a really kind of cool restricted data type that's just in, right in between. It's like, no, no, no. Every element of the list is the same type, and that type is something that is either an integer or a char. <laughs> so anyway, I think it's kind of cool that you can. Um, that you can do that. Um, is there a reason we need to have that left and right? Couldn't you just say type either A, B equals A or B? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Would we have to define left and right for the compiler to be happy? No. No, you don't. Um, huh. Could you just put A or B? I'm not sure that you could. 
like I guess I don't see the purpose of the left or right. Like I don't understand yeah, yeah, what yeah. they're bringing I, to the I table. Think, I think you need it for matching purposes, but maybe I'm wrong. I admit I got this example from the internet. Because because that sounds like it's saying it's of type left specialized with type A yes. or type right specialized with type B. Yes, and. and that seems like a whole layer of complexity that's not necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I will find out though, because now I'm curious. So I'm gonna write this on my list of things to do. Thanks for bringing that up. No problem. I think it probably has something to do with matching. That's just my intuition, but I'm, I'll have to, I'll have to go write a few things, write a few test cases and see. Um, let's see, so we've got a couple of other questions here. What happens when you try to put something that isn't one of those into this list? The answer is you get a compile, like you, you can't do it at compile time. So the compiler will yell at you. Um, Grant asks, do you have to use either int char or can you use int or char? Hmm. I see. In other words, do we have to give it a name? It's um, a good question. I don't know. Someone wants to pull up the REPL and try it out. Um, yeah. My guess is that you, you could probably, yeah, so like do we even need the either keyword is the question. I don't know. Um, it's a good question. I'll write that one down too. You guys ask good questions, thank you. Yeah, let's all try it. Uh, that would be interesting to know. Okay, let's see, where are we on time? Oh dear, we're almost out of time. Um, I'll just point out a few things about record types. Uh, so records are kind of like uh, dictionaries in other languages. So you have things like, um, you have things like, uh, like an X is a float, a Y is a float, a Z is a float. This will give you um, a little like, data structure where you can get to X, Y, and Z. Uh, you can alias that as a thing called point 3D and you automatically get a constructor that goes with it. So you can instantiate things that are of type point 3D by just saying point 3D and then giving it three values and those three values become the X, the Y, and the Z. Um, here's another slightly more complicated example. Where we're creating this thing called the TV show and the TV show uh, has a creator and F number of episodes and a name. So you can instantiate it, for example, Firefly equals TV show, Joss, 14, Firefly, et cetera. And yes, you could access that as origin.x. So it look, sort of feels a lot like dictionaries in other languages. Um, there's a couple of interesting things about records. We won't probably go into it in this class, but um, I'll just highlight what it, interestingly enough, what Elm does for you is when you create a type alias like this, it automatically creates functions called dot x dot y and dot z which you can use in conjunction with things like map and fold to extract those elements out of a list uh, or a set of these uh, of these records so it's kind of convenient it does a lot of things to try to help you out um, semantic that would be like an example of semantics um, um let's see so Sorry. what's the difference between um type alias versus just a type annotation yeah, so a type alias, that's a good question. Shoot, I knew you were gonna ask me this. I even looked it up and I have forgotten. Um, man, you guys ask too many questions. <laughs> that's not true, too many good questions, too many hard questions. I will look that up too and I will let you know. So uh, there is a difference between a type alias and a type annotation, and I read it quickly, and I honestly can't remember the answer, but I will look it up and find out. Okay, we only no, no, it's okay, it's good, keep asking. This is the first time I've ever tried to teach Elm, and so I don't even know what I don't know. So it's okay. Uh, it's kind of fun to learn though, right? So last thing we'll talk about um, for today is, Actually, I'm not even sure we need to talk about this. Um, well, yeah, I just want to show you kind of some of the beauty and elegance of pattern matching and cool type annotations 
So this is the type annotation. This is a, a version of the fold L function. So remember fold left, we've seen this way back in the racket, early days of rat, when we started learning racket. And let's look at what the type signature is. So the type signature for fold L is the first thing you give me is a function. And that function takes two parameters, A and B, and then gives you another thing of B. You start off with a thing of type B and a list of things of type A, and the final result will be something of type B. So remember in fold, you have an accumulator. So let's imagine that the first parameter is, um, I don't know, like a, um, it's um, like a something that would take, let's, let's imagine that I wanted to, I give you a list of strings, and I want to calculate the total length of all of the strings together, okay? So type A here will be a list of strings. So A is strings, and Bs are integers. And we have to give it an initial integer, which will start, we'll say, a zero. And then you have to give me a function that accepts as input a string and whatever the current total length is, and will give me back a new current total length. Then the compiler knows that if you give me that function, that thing, and this list, the result will be something of type B. And so here you can sort of see how it's gonna work. So fold L, you mean the function, the accumulator, and the list. If the list is empty, then I just return whatever the accumulator says. Otherwise, and this is the thing I wanted to point out, we pattern match on the list itself. And this colon colon syntax is just like first and rest that we've seen in Lisp and we've seen in Prolog. Now we're seeing it in Elm. So X will be the first element of the list. XS will be the rest of the list. And then we'll recurse. We'll call fold L, pass in the same function. We'll call the function on the head of the list and give it the current accumulator. That'll give us an updated version of the accumulator, which we'll pass in along with the rest of the list. So it's a very beautiful, um, and I think it's just cool to look at these type annotations and to really see like, wow, um, even things like fold, which is pretty complicated, um, we can do a pretty good job of annotating what the types are gonna be and the compiler can help us out with all um, ch type checking all of those things. Um, we're gonna skip map two. Okay, with, oh wow, we are totally out of time. Um, thanks everybody, that was great. I really enjoyed that, I hope you did too. You got some good questions. I'll try to go figure those out. And we will pick up with the MVC software pattern on Wednesday. So until then, have a great day. Uh, before I leave, um, just to double check the installing Elm, there are instructions at the top. We just follow those, I guess, right? Yep. Okay. Should, be, should be pretty easy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good luck.